Hello and welcome to the first episode of the Toyota Prius Gen 2 VCU setup video. So in this video I will kind of explain the theory of operation or I will show you on the screen basically how to connect things up and then Damien will come in and actually show you on the physical hardware what to do. Okay, this will be, uh, I will be talking from the off just to a microphone and I will explain stuff on the screen capture. So, we will start um, by looking at the connector of this Mod Ice enclosure. So the left hand one is uh, the connection to the outside world, your throttle pedal and brake pedal and stuff like that. And the right one connects to the inverter and we will take a brief look at that. This is the inverter, inside the inverter. So you have uh, 32 pins, two are vacant, so we have a total of 30 signals and we need to pick the right ones to get operational. So, we will start with the inverter connector. And it starts at pin 21 and then wiggles over to 26, 27, 32. Like left to right. So the first four signals are current returns. And why is it four? I will go into that in a minute. So most importantly the uh, these two. This is the phase current one and two of the MG2 power stage. An MG2 power stage is the stronger one, and that's the one that we are going to be using to drive a motor. MG1 power stage will save a different purpose. And likewise here on pin 21 and 23, we have the first and second phase current from the weaker MG1 power stage. Then on pin 25, we have the voltage on the DC bus. So basically that is um, behind the booster converter. Pin 26 is a temperature signal. So that's the MG2 power stage temperature. 27 is a fault signal, this one. And that becomes like a high voltage, around 6 or 7 volt, as soon as you connect the enable pin to 12 volts. And I will show you the enable pin in a minute. And then the next three pins are the actual PWM pins. They are called MUU, MVU and MWU. <laughs> uh, because they describe the motor fails as UVW. And then here we have the PWM for the booster, bug boost converter. And the last pin is just ground. Now, to enable the power stage in the first place, we have to find pin 25 on it. And I can, whoops, wrong window, I can show you uh, here. This is. Uh, yeah, the brown one, 25. And that one needs to be permanently tied to 12 volt to enable the power stage, MG2 power stage, in the first place. And that pin is called MSDN, motor shutdown. And we will not go into charge mode uh, today. And thanks to some very active forum members, we have this nice graphical um, wiring diagram, uh, which shows you what to do. So, for example, uh, the three WM pins you can see here, and you can see how they run from 28 to 9, 10 and 11 of the inverter connector. Now let's quickly go over the various sections of the board. So up here we have the I.O. connectors, inverter and outside board. I will go over these in a minute. 
We have the PWM output driver. We have various signal conditioning, for example, for scaling the plus minus 15 volt current sensor feedback to 3.3 uh, volt unipolar. Here we have the main processor, CAN transceiver, Wi Fi module socket, power supply section, exciter amplifier for the resolver. I will demonstrate that in a minute. And then here we have some. MOSFETs for driving pre-charge and main contactor. Um, and up here you see a little note about solder jumpers. And before I turn the board around, there on the back, um, on the newest revision boards, sorry I didn't put one here, there's another solder jumper uh, right here that lets you enable the CAN <coughs> termination resistor should your device be the first or the last on the CAN bus. Now, on the back here, we have two unlabeled solder jumpers, that is SJ1 and 2, and they are needed if you operate, uh, yeah, normally in a synchronous motor, induction motor, uh, with encoder feedback. And these encoder feedbacks are usually open collector, so they need a, a pull-up resistor, and this pull-up resistor is being enabled by putting a drop of solder over these solder jumpers. Hello folks. So here we are on the bench now with our VCU that Johannes has uh, described to you, described the various pins and where we wish to connect them. But just to show here for the sake of clarity, what we're doing here is the gray connector uh, are basically our signals that we're going to generate here like throttle and so forth and 12 volt power and the black one here goes to our gen 2 prius inverter now first thing that we want to show you here is how to safely apply 12 volt power to your system now it's at, the, it's at this stage that the first mistake can be made like having 12 volts applied to the wrong pin or a mistake in a wiring harness or a short circuit. And for the purposes of this uh, tutorial, I'm going to be assuming that you don't have any kind of fancy things like a current limited power supply um and so forth in fact the only test equipment that we're going to use uh on this would be just a basic multimeter so how do we safely apply 12 volts to test uh that our system works now again just for simplicity we have a standard 12 volt lead acid uh car battery here capable of pumping out several hundred amps uh, to start an internal combustion engine. It would also be perfectly comfortable pumping all of that current into your VCU if you had it incorrectly wired. So, what we need to do is put a device in here that has a low resi resi resistance uh, when there's a low current flow and a high resistance when there's a higher current flow. Fortunately, a humble 12 volt car headlamp bulb um, will do just that for us. Uh, so what I've done here is my red wire with this crocodile clip is my 12 volt positive supply to my VCU. I've got my negative supply uh, already attached here to the negative battery terminal. And what I'm doing is I'm simply connecting this 12 volt lamp, uh, it's a 12 volt 55 watt headlamp, uh, in series with my 12 volt supply. So I'm going from the battery through the lamp and into my circuit. So what we will do here is we will connect the yellow cable to our uh, battery here. Let me just get my high-tech terminal on there. 
and uh, what we expect to see is that the VCU powers up and that the bulb here does not illuminate. So let's see what happens. And as we can see, that works exactly as anticipated. The reason we don't want to see the bulb Ill illuminate is that the VCU draws a very small current and it's not nearly enough current to heat up the little filament in our lamp. If we had a fault in there and our VCU uh, was short circuited or we connected something wrong, then we automatically limit the current because the lamp will illuminate. So now that we have passed that milestone, uh, we can simply go ahead now and disconnect here and we can now come down to our inverter and here we have our Gen 2 Toyota Prius inverter and we have connected our uh, signal harness up to this um, using the wiring diagram uh, that we have now standardized and this little uh, plug here contains the various drive signals and feedback signals and this one is our 12 volt supply there's two wires on this we've got a red and we've got a blue now what I've done here is I've put some heat shrink on here but until we verify everything is correct, I, I have not shrunk that. As you can see here from this will go over and tidy up all of that wiring. So now we can go ahead, plug our 12 volt supply into that uh, harness connector there. So now we have signals coming in here. We have 12 volt power coming in here. So now that we have the 12 volt power connected to the inverter and the VCU, we're going to repeat our light bulb test to ensure that there's nothing silly going on here in the inverter. Now we do expect to have some slightly different behavior this time. So let's see what happens. And Actually, much to my, yes, here we go. Perfect. So we get a small glow from our lamp here, but it is by no means, you know, fully bright. Now the reason for that, and the reason that it takes it a while to warm up, is that the inverter power supply for the gate driver is a switch mode power supply, so it takes it a little bit of time to power up, and it then stabilizes. What we did not want to see there would be that the very second that we touch this on here that this bulb goes to full brightness that would be bad it would indicate that we had either a fault in our wiring or that we had uh, maybe a bad inverter. Now do we have verified now we've got no problems in our 12 volt supply. We can now safely go ahead and uh, connect up our 12 volt battery directly uh, to our inverter. Now there'd be no harm at all to have a little five or a 10 amp fuse in here. But keep in mind folks that a fuse will not protect your VCU or your inverter, it's there to protect the wiring only, hence our little light bulb uh, um, uh, test. So we can now apply 12 volts directly and our VCU powers up and we will see that there's three red LEDs, two constant and one flashing. The flashing red LED is very important because that tells us basically that the microcontroller is executing software. So let's have a look at our uh, inverter 
and transaxle setup now so that we get a better idea of what we're trying to do. Okay, so as you can see here, we have our inverter converter here. We have our signals and our 12 volt now uh, successfully functioning. And you will see here that on the floor, I have a Gen 2 uh, Prius trans axle. And I have connected its MG2 high voltage three phase cable to the MG2 um, three phase output from our inverter converter. We have not connected the MG1 cable, which is hiding down here. Let's see if I can get it. This is our MG1. We are not using that at this time so we can just tuck that away uh, down there now this particular transaxle i have taken apart and welded the power split device planet carrier in there so that mg1 and mg2 are now mechanically linked all of the time and turn at the same speed. The reason for that is to allow us to use the two mo motors to turn our wheels of our vehicle. Uh, there's more detail on that in some videos that I did previously, so I'm not going to rehash over that. Now, the advantage for us here now at this point of that is that while I don't actually have a set of um, stubs to go into the, uh, the, what are they called? The differential splines, I guess, I, guess, I guess. We can still see the rotation by means of looking at the uh, input shaft here and know that that's actually is turning at the same speed as MG2 and we're bringing mg1 along with it but that's uh, not important for what we're trying to do here so let's get you in here for a little bit of a closer look at the inverter okay so a bit of a closer look at the inv inverter again here and you will see that we have our mg2 three phase wires connected and screwed down with some m6 bolts now at this point, we want to apply some quote unquote high voltage in order to first of all test that our VCU and our inver inverter are communicating and that we can generate in open loop mode some three phase AC feed it into MG2 and see that MG2 rotates. Now, in order to do that, we are going to apply our high voltage, and I will explain what we mean by that in a minute, to these two bus bars here. We're going to bypass the original connections. And the reason for that is that we don't want to be sending our current through the uh, buck boost converter here we just want to go directly into the high voltage terminal so let me get you in here a little bit neater all righty so the inside copper bus bar here this guy is our uh, hv positive and the outer one here is our hv negative and i've got just two Bay pieces of 2.5 millimeter squared wire attached to these two bolt terminals here and I've got myself a little high voltage control setup that I'm going to show you now and it's the way that I would strongly recommend that uh, people proceed uh, when they want to do particularly initial testing and particularly when they may not be familiar with how these things can go wrong and so forth. Now, if 
first of all we're going to look at our high voltage negative wire and it's very very simple folks this just goes directly from our negative terminal here which is the outer copper bar directly you can see there i'll get my get something to point for you something metal obviously so that i can create a short circuit and that simply goes directly in here to our high voltage battery negative uh, which i have just on a crocodile clip for the purposes of this test today we're running at about 160 volts dc now i recommend that when you want to test your systems as a lot of people seem to want to do on the bench these days that you run between 80 and about 160 to 200 volts uh, lower is better to start with obviously um, but 150 is kind of a good mix now over here on this piece of wood I have three things I have a fuse I think it's rated about 20 amps I have a switch which is now stuck to my pointing device and I have a 240 volt 100 watt filament lamp this isn't LED or CFL or anything this is just an old type filament lamp now the working of this circuit it's extremely simple. So we're going to take a bit of time to talk through this because I know that people struggle with this stuff. Our high voltage battery positive comes in here. And the first thing that it does is it goes through this filament lamp. Comes out of the filament lamp. Goes up through the switch through the fuse and back to our inverter positive this switch here is connected in parallel with this lamp meaning that i can choose to turn that switch on and it will bypass our filament lamp basically shorting this circuit out and meaning that the effective circuit then is that our high voltage positive comes in goes through the switch goes through the fuse and goes to our inverter converter now the purpose of this is twofold the first is to pre-charge our inverter capacitor i'm not going to explain what that is if you do not understand that please stop what you're doing now and go and learn how EV pre-charging works. The lamp is particularly useful here because it will give us a visual indication of that pre-charging process as we will see in a few minutes. Also, during initial testing, it will illuminate depending on how much current that our system draws here. And it will also serve to limit any fault currents that our inverter converter may try to draw from our high voltage battery so just like we did with our 12 volt power we're going to do a similar thing here with our high voltage and the reason is again we could have a bad inverter we could have connected our high voltage wiring backwards we could have accidentally connected the battery backwards. We could have a short. We could have any number of problems in our high voltage side here. And a simple, you know, I don't know how much these things cost, but I'll say one euro light bulb will provide all of the safety uh, that you need here in order to not destroy something um, you know damage your inverter damage a lot more stuff and again please note folks that a fuse in this case will not prevent damage to the inverter 
it will fail eventually if we have something silly like a short circuit or something going on. Its job is to protect the wiring from getting too hot, not to protect your inverter electronics. That is what we use our little light bulb for. So, at this point now, what we are going to do is using a crocodile clip here that you can't see, it's just on the board here. Let me put you down here, you can see it. I'm going to take that crocodile clip, I'm going to attach it in here to my battery positive. Now, while I do that, I would like you to observe how our light bulb acts. Get my big head out of your way. So here I go. I'm now connecting my high voltage positive in here. Now, did we all observe that? So what we saw was our light bulb illuminated brightly and then dimmed down and is now completely extinguished. That is the pre-charging of our DC bus capacitors here now completed. And as we can see, we are drawing no current. So our system comprised of our inverter, comprised of our transaxle, and up here on the bench, comprised of our VCU, our 12 volt battery, and our high voltage battery is now ready to accept commands. So we are going to move to that stage now. So in order to make this easier to see, I put a little bit of tape onto our um, former input shaft here. I'm now going to come over to the computer. I'm going to set F slip set point to three hertz. I'm going to press enter. I'm going to set amp non to 10% and press enter. Now, what we see at the minute is that there's nothing happening with our motor, but I can hear a whine uh, coming from our inverter, so that's good. I'm going to take amp norm up to 15% and press enter. Still nothing, 20%. We can see now that we've some activity. I'm going to increase to 25. And we can see that we now have our motor rotating in open loop mode. And that's exactly what we want to see, just a low speed, like so. And this proves that our inv inverter, VCU, motor, connections, high voltage system, the whole lot are working as they should. We can also observe that our light bulb has started to glow dimly. And that is because we are drawing a small current from our high voltage battery into our inverter in order to spin our motor. And that's perfectly fine. That's doing exactly as we want it to do. If this bulb were glowing brightly or flashing or doing anything other than it's doing now without the motor spinning, we would know that we had a problem somewhere. And that's exactly uh, how we want this to behave. For example, I can now set my amp nom back to zero and our light bulb goes out. I could at this point, if I wish to, Choose to close this switch now, perfectly safely. We have a no current flow. And I can do the whole retuning thing again. And we can hear our motor spinning away merrily. We're not obviously illuminating the bulb here because we have bypassed it with our switch. When we know that it's now safe, to do this and again we can see here that our motor is spinning away merrily and that's more than 
enough uh, for us to see that our inverter, VCU, motor, high voltage, pre-charging batteries, everything in our little setup here is working as we intend it to. Now folks, the next part of the operation that we're going to describe to you here is how we configure our motor, transaxle, whatever it may be, for closed loop control using the new field orientated control or FOC firmware from the open inverter system. So we're going to show you how to connect the resolver, how to uh, ensure we have our resolver connections correct and how to troubleshoot and how to backtrack uh, when we have problems. It's not if, it's just when. Now I would encourage everyone who is trying to tune any open inverter motor with the FOC firmware to please put your tools down and follow the procedure that we are outlining for you here. So Johannes will describe to you how the feedback system works and I'm then going to come along and show you here how we go about um, connecting the resolver to the VCU and checking our signal integrity and all of these other steps. Okay, now as promised, uh, here's a quick demonstration of uh, the resolver circuit. So a resolver is being used um, in all synchronous motors, be it, be it the previous transaxle or the leaf motor or whatever. And what it needs is like a sinusoidal excitation uh, signal, which it will then, then transform back to the sine and cosine uh, feedback signals at a kind of amplitude modulated signal. And we recover the rotor position from that. So, to use resolver mode, obviously you set ENC mode to resolver. Focus here. Um, and that's it. And for testing, what I've hooked up here is um, the 12 volt supply. Just put that to the inside of the pin and uh, ground also here. And then I'm supplying 12 volts also to the fault feedback pin so the inverter doesn't uh, just fold out right after it was started. And then here and here, I've <laughs> kind of confused. I have uh, connected to pins 4 and 5 a little speaker. So, as soon as we go into run mode, that is the excitation signal being generated. Okay folks, so in this segment we're going to describe to you how to connect and determine the resolver connections. So two things here before we begin. One, this will apply to any resolver on a permanent magnet or indeed an induction motor. It does not matter if it is this motor. It can be any of them, they will all behave the same way. Secondly, you will need, as well as your wire, you will need some paper and a pen and a basic multimeter. So what I'm going to go ahead now is I'm going to plug this connector from our trusty Toyota loom that I've extended with a bit of multi-core cable here. As you see we have six wires, all of them different colors. I've stripped off the ends of them. It will not matter whether you have a wiring diagram for your resolver or not because in fact it doesn't matter. Now 
So let's go ahead and connect this uh, plug here. It's all over for MG2, get our little click and we're all good. So, step number one is we want a multimeter that can read low DC resistance. Usually the lowest range on these things is about 200 ohms. We're going to take our resolver cable and note I don't have any wiring diagrams or pinouts for this. We're going to work completely blind and we can show you how we do that. So we've our two multimeter probes. We just verify firstly that um, they are indeed giving us pretty much close to zero ohms. And for the sake of simplicity, we're just going to use two little clip leads here, just onto them uh, so that I can clip on. So what we're going to do is we're going to determine which of these wires is a pair. So we should have three pairs. So we're going to take the blue wire. Clip one lead onto that, and then I'm just going to play around here until I find, oh yeah, there was something going on there. Okay, so between the blue wire and the pink wire, I have 10 ohms. So, I'm going to write down blue plus pink is equal to 10 ohms. So that is a pair. So we're going to just again to make life easy for ourselves once we find a pair we just twist them together like this as well so next up is the yellow wire let's see if we can find a match for him no right i think the brown possibly yes yellow plus brown equal to in this case 16 ohms and we'll take our yellow and our brown that kind of leaves us then it has to be the green and the red as the last pair indeed it is We've got green plus red to 16 ohms. Alright, we'll just twist those there now just so we can uh, have our three pairs. Now, so that is step number one. So, folks, what we've got here is we have three pairs, a blue and a pink wire that had 10 ohms of resistance, a yellow and a brown that had 16, and a green and a red that also have 16. Now, all resolvers will exhibit similar ratios. The resistances will not be the same, but what you will see is that two pairs have almost bang on the same resistance and one pair will have much less the one that has much less in our case the blue and the pink is the exciter winding the exciter winding is always the one that has the lowest resistance these two here are either sine or cosine and, and this is critical it does not matter which is which for our purposes. I might ask Johannes to explain the maths in in that in the in that, uh, but he did that in a previous video anyway. What does matter? And this is the critical bit. What does matter is which of these of the yellow and the brown and the green and the red is the winding end okay so 
In order to determine that, we need to make a little chart. Now, this is the part that I really need people to get. There are two pairs of two wires, meaning there are four wires. We therefore have, on a polarity swap basis, four combinations of those wires. Any of these four will show us our nice graph, as we will see soon, and will give some kind of operation of the motor in closed loop mode. But this is the critical bit. Only one of these will work your motor properly. The other three are there to fool you. They're there to make you think that everything's fine, to make you think that you have it tuned perfectly, but it's not. And the reason is that from the start, you only have a one in four chance of having gotten this correctly. It does not matter if you have a wiring diagram, a pinout, a PhD in resolvers, you still have to go through this process. So now that we have our exciter and we'll call them our two feedback windings identified. We will now just pick the first setup here and connect it to our VCU and see what we get. So what I strongly recommend that you do at this time is to bring out your resolver wires to a piece of connector block like this from the VCU. And the reason is that lets us easily change our combinations uh, depending on what we need to test. So the first thing that we're going to connect is the resolver exciter. And that is the blue and the pink pair that we identified previously. I'm going to connect those to the exciter output from our uh, VCU. The polarity of these does not matter. It does not matter if you swap the polarity of these because in doing so you would simply be swapping the polarity of both the feedback windings and there is no point in doing that. Now we, ha we now have three wires to connect four and the, re the reason is that the green one, this is pin two here on our uh, uh, gray plug, is a common uh, connection point. So what I'm going to do is based on our wiring diagram and our little chart that we made, that we made I'm going to choose uh, number one. I'm going to take the yellow and the green as my as my um, as my winding start connections. I'm going to twist those together. I'm going to connect those then to my uh, common pin here like so and then we're going to take our other two and just choose whichever one we want to connect here and uh, it doesn't really matter for the purposes of this initial set up because as I say we only have a one in four chance of getting this right from the beginning and trust me when I say I'm very rarely if ever that lucky with these sort of things so I'll connect this guy here And that's it. That is our initial resolver connection. Now, let's take a look at the outside world connector. And it starts out with the resolver. And um, for this episode, we will assume a resolver connection, no um, encoder or something. So, pin one 
is the sign feedback signal. Pin 2 is the sine and cosine common potential, that's like 1.6 volts. Pin 3 is the cosine cosine signal. And pin 4 and 5 are the exciter winding. And Damien will go into more detail of how you find which one's which and um, yeah. And how to find the right connection. Then here on pin 6 we have a 5 volt. We can use it for our throttle signal or for supplying an encoder, whatever. And we have uh, two analog throttle inputs, so either you can use a redundant um, throttle pedal with two return lines, um, or you can use the second input for, um, for adjusting region. Then we have a number of digital signals, the start. Um, you give that a pulse and you put the inverter in run mode if all preconditions are met. Um, break can be configured to give you some extra um, some extra region once you touch uh, the brake pedal and it will also uh, cancel the cruise control should you be using that. Then we tell uh, the motor to go forward to turn to a forward or reverse or if none of both are selected it is in neutral. Then here we have um, supply and sense for a motor temperature sensor. Here we have a, well let's say 5 amp output for a relay, the main DC relay. And same here for the pre-charge relay. And here, if you want to go uh, full on modern, we can use can high and can low to basically substitute most of the traditional signals here by can signals. And then finally, we have a ground and 12 volt supply. Okay, folks, this is the point that we want to get you to. You got your throttle pedal and you give it some gas. And that happens. Now, as the old saying goes, there is many to slip between cup and lip. And this is where uh, a lot of, pe of people are experiencing problems. So I'm going to basically walk you backwards now from here uh, to where we start and some of the pitfalls uh, that I hit along the way on this particular tune. Now, I will also be posting the parameter file uh, for this tune on the open inverter form and I would encourage people uh, to use this for this particular setup and indeed to post their own files when they get a similar performance um, happen. So in true predictable fashion it was, of course, the last configuration of the four possible resolver feedback connections that actually works. The other three give us a variety of uh, silly things, which we're going to discuss uh, now. All righty. So we're here with our laptop. And this is our web interface, as we know. And we have loaded, if we come down here, just hit the refresh. We've loaded our FOC firmware. We've correctly detected it as being a, Pri a Prius. 
and our off mode is currently in the off position. Now the first thing that we need to do here before we do anything else at all is to ensure that our resolver signal is being received by the STM32 microcontroller in our VCU board. There is absolutely no point at all in doing anything else if that's not the case. The first step is that we ensure that all of the high voltage is completely turned off. So we've got no HV at all. We don't need it. What we do need is we need access to the motor shaft so that we can manually turn it. Now, although in this transaxle, uh, MG2 would normally not be connected to the, I guess, engine input shaft that you see there. In this case, because we have the welded power split device, it in fact is. So we can simply take my piece of rather tough duct tape off here and just put uh, vice grips on here and just confirm that we can do a full revolution so that is our first thing that we need to do back up on the computer we want to go to commands want to hit start inverter in manual mode we're going to just drop right back down here and just hit refresh you will see that up mode has changed to manual run, which is exactly what we want to see. Next thing we're going to do, we're going to scroll down here until we find a parameter called angle. This guy here. We're going to, it's a little box here, L and R. And what they mean is that we can graph from either the left or the right Y axis. So we're just going to choose left. Little tick mark and that. I'm going to come down here. I'm going to hit the start plot button. And we're just going to stop. So let it run for a few seconds and stop. The first thing that we're looking for is that we get a little bit of what's called jitter going on here. Now, what that is, is that we should see that our angle, even though we're not turning, the motor it's a little bit of noise on it and we can see here that our jitter at its worst case seems to be about from 204 degrees to 207 it's a little bit high but it's it does vary and we can come down to even much lower values here of less than one degree so that's perfectly acceptable if we were jittering more then about five degrees, um, we would have a problem and we would need to resolve that problem before taking a single other step, folks, okay? Like if this was jumping 100 degrees or something all over the screen, stop, you've got a problem in your resolver circuit somewhere. So, now that we have that done, I'm gonna restart the plot then I'm going to go down to the motor here. I'm going to rotate it through a few turns and we will observe what we see on our screen here. So let's hit that start plot again. And now I'm just going to go. There's one turn, two turns, and I'll go one more. And there's three turns and I'm going to just hit stop. Now, what we get is this little jumping waveform here but if we have a look we can see that it's broadly changing from about zero to 360 degrees the reason that you're seeing it not quite reaching 360 and not quite reaching zero here is that this is a low speed plot so what we need to do next this is the third test is we need to crank up our data points and crank up our burst here and then we want to go start plot again and now I'm going to go crank it 
And what you should see is this much more detailed waveform. I'm going to have to hit stop, 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 stop. There we go. And let's see if I got one. I did get one. And we can see here that we had a jump from zero to 360 and we were coming back again. So that's very good. That is basically um, what we want to see when our resolver is provi providing a accurate signal. So I'm just going to go back to commands. I'm going to stop the inverter there. Now one thing here, you can see that the last error is a throttle one. That's because I was messing about with my throttle settings. If this said low res amplitude or something like that, then um, that is our microcontroller telling us that the amplitude of the received signal is too low. That is another problem that we would have. So at this point now, we're going to remove the vice grips from my motor, like so. And we're going to go to step two. Step two is where we need to configure our current sensor positions for our FOC firmware in our Gen 2 inverter. And currently, at the time of making this video, this has to be done manually through the custom command box. What we need to do is type the word set, space, pin swap, space, five, and set, send custom command. Just tap that. We'll come down here then, and it should say set OK. Now, let's go over the rather infamous topic of pin swapping. And this is important only if you use the FOC software. The sign software doesn't care and also doesn't have uh, the apparent parameter that we will see in a minute. So, ideally what we want is that the phase that's being driven by PWM1 is being sensed by current input IL1. And likewise PWM2 being sensed by IL2 and PWM3 if not sensed at all. Unfortunately though, this is not quite what Toyota gives us. What they do give us is that PWM1 is not sensed at all, PWM2 is sensed by IL1 and PWM3 is sensed by IL2. And the FOC transformations assume the above configuration and thus will not really work or kind of seem to work but at some point like when reversing the motor you will find it does not work. It's a bit tricky. Um, but we can mitigate this with a parameter called pin swap. And yeah, that is what's called a bit field. I will go into this in a second. Um, now what pin swap allows us to do is to change or to swap these labels around. So now you can see PWM1 has gone to the bottom here and PWM3 has gone to the top. Yeah, and that happens by setting pin swap to a value of four. So now we are a bit closer to what we want. PWM1 is being sensed by IL2 and PWM2 is being sensed by IL1. So these two are still swapped around. And yeah, PWM3 is now the unsensed phase. <coughs> now to get this right, we also have to swap these two labels around. And that's what I did down here. And that's what I mean by bit field. You can swap more than one pin with the pin swap command uh, parameter by just adding the bits. So the basically the bit number two um, swaps the PWM phases, and then bit zero that is yeah swaps the current inputs. And if you want to swap both, you just add those two, and you end up at pin swap five. 
Okay, so now just by swapping the labels around, we have arrived by what we wanted initially. PWM1 is sensed by IL1, PWM2 is sensed by IL2, PWM3 is not sensed at all. Next, we need to set some parameters about our motor. In this case, we are working with MG2 from the Gen 2 trans axle. And again, this parameter file will be available on the open inverter form. But the most important ones that we want to set are pole pairs to 4, resolver pole pairs to 2, and encoder mode to resolver. When we first start, we will have a sync offset value of zero. Now, it is very important at this stage that we understand that at this point, we do not want to vary that value. This is the initial setup. So just leave that at zero and please do not change it. Next up, we want to come down and set our PWM frequency to 4.4 kilohertz. Our next one is our current sensor gains. Again, I've worked these out for you. And a gain of 3.1 digits per amp seems to give a good value for the MG2, um, the MG2 power stage in the Gen 2 inverter. For the purposes of testing, we want to set UDC min to zero. UDC max can be some high value. Set our heatsink temperature max to 150. Motor to 300. Again, these don't matter. They're just to stop it from shutting down when we're trying to perform tests. Uh, throttle calibration we'll get to. We don't need a throttle at this exact moment. UDCSW to zero. And we'll just save everything one more time there just to make sure we got all that. Now, at this point now, we're going to just refresh and we're in condition off. So that's exactly where we want to be. Now, what I have done now is I have reconnected our high voltage battery, about 160 volts and it is connected through the 100 watt filament lamp and that's very important that we do that so our first foray into tuning is where we come to commands and we hit start inverter in manual mode come down and just click refresh and confirm that we're in manual run just pop up here a little bit Went to the manual ID box and just enter one amp and press enter. So what I can hear now is I have a little bit of a whine coming from the motor. And my sh the motor shaft just gave a little bit of a jerk. That's exactly what I want. I'm going to increase this to two amps. My motor has now started to turn. But now the motor has stopped and the light bulb has illuminated. That's perfectly fine. I will demonstrate this to you here now again. So let's have a look at what happens when I put in two amps of manual ID. Maybe it needs three. There we go. And we come to a stop. And we come to a stop because I will now do the very same procedure here, but let you look at how our little filament lamp behaves. And now moves to three amps and press enter. Motor spins up, lamp illuminates, and we stop. Now, the importance of that test is, if we did not have our current sensors properly calibrated, if we did not have our pin swap properly set up, the inverter would go to full power 
and draw as much current as the battery could provide and attempt to inject that current into our motor and that would not be good it could do all kinds of things it would be jumping around the room and burning out and causing us all problems so this simple little cheap and cheerful component saves us all of those problems now at this point we have verified that we have our current sensors correct we can spin the motor with a little bit of manual ID current. The next thing that we want to do is to switch on our bypass switch. So we have now bypassed our filament lamp. We're allowing basically as much current as the battery can provide and that fuse will provide it for a particular period of time. So now what we can do is go back and repeat that little test. So one more time, I'm gonna select three amps and press enter. Now back to zero. And that's exactly what we want to see. That is our first tuning step done. We have resolver feedback. We have control over the stator currents. So those are two things that we have now achieved. Okay. Okay, folks, so a couple of days have passed since I was shooting the last segments. And Johannes and I worked uh, on a particular problem that we were experiencing both with this, the Gen 2 and the Gen 3 system. And that is when we would reverse the uh, motor after having successfully tuned it. Uh, there would be very unpredictable behavior like the motor would run away by itself and accelerate, decelerate very violently. Uh, that turned out to be a little bug in the open inverter FOC firmware that has now been fixed. So what I'm going to do firstly here is just show you uh, very quick quickly our gen 2 transaxle here uh, running in both directions i won't accelerate it too much because this particular one uh, does not have any lubricating oil in it at the present time so this i think is forward oh no that's reverse sorry that's so that's reverse direction, so perfectly fine. Over here to the computer, and I'm just too lazy to um, I'm too lazy to move the wires on the battery, so I just do it on the computer. But it's got the same effect, so we should now be going forward. Oh. And there we go. So perfectly fine. And our Gen Three system uh is also uh working away perfectly so what we're going to do now is we're going to have a little bit of a revisit on our tuning and we will again show you the tuning procedure i'm going to use the gen 3 system that i have on the bench here uh, because it has uh, got oil in it so we can run this forward backwards at higher speeds and make sure that we have our tune spot on but I would uh, like to just be very clear on it that this procedure will apply to any uh, permanent magnet motor, uh, regardless of the kind of names that they like to call them. Sometimes it applies equally to this, you know, simple, cheap Gen 2 Prius MG2 as it does to a modern uh, Tesla Model 3 rear drive unit. So let's have a quick look at our tuned in uh, Gen 3 and then we will look at how we go about the tuning just one more time in very very um, exquisite detail okay so uh, Gen 3 transaxle 
And this is a, uh, I think this is a, oh, what you call it, a Yaris in, in inverter. We're hooked into MG2 in this again, and just to be super, super clear, this has the welded power split device in it also, just like our Gen 2 system. So, but because we have lubricating oil in this, we can spin it up. So this is forwards. And we can regen, accelerate. Regen. So that is with uh, field weakening functioning um, also. So I will now just go on the computer and uh, let me just fetch the computer won't um, behave itself here now. So I need to change from the Gen 2 uh, to the Gen 3 uh, system. I'm just betting that it won't work. My old enemy is the uh, the public Wi-Fi company are blasting me with more of their um, with more of their waves again. Ah, we are in excellent. So let's reverse here. Uh, reverse. So we should be now reverse on our Gen Three, and we are. So that is just demonstrating that we can indeed now get perfectly functioning uh, forward and reverse um, operation out of our um, FOC firmware, uh, both with the Gen 2 and the Gen 3 uh, Prius trans axles here. Uh, and as I say, that will apply to pretty much any uh, permanent magnet motor. So. Uh, let's have a look at our tuning. Okay, folks. So, there's a saying in this part of the world, and that is that I couldn't draw the doll. And it is very true. My artistic skills are pretty much um, zero. But I did manage to do this little uh, play school sketch for you. And I think it is quite important. What we have here is a representation of the values of sync offset. Sync offset is probably really the most important parameter that we need to tune for our individual motors. And it is also definitely the most misunderstood. I've seen people doing all kinds of strange things with this when in truth, they don't actually really need to do that much at all. <clears throat> if we take this value as being zero of sync offset, and this value at the very end as being 65,535, and if we were to plot, if we were to set our system up to tune, if we were to plot every single value, so from zero to 65,535 values. And if we were to enter our fixed ID, we would find that in all of this area here, the motor would just spin up. In all of this area here, the motor would just spin up. Now, what that tells us is that those are the wrong values. This is the important point. If we can spin the motor with just ID manual, then we have the wrong value of sync offset. As we approach the correct value, we're going to notice that it takes more and more ID. So if this is, I think I suppose what I should do, is I should have ID manual here and this is like you know nearly like you know let's say two amps and this is like a million amps or like a thousand amps or something or you know something very large value so for a very small value of id the motor will spin up in these areas here now as we approach this is the value of sync offset down here 
that we want is the absolute bottom of this little trough. And what we're going to see is that as we approach it, okay, as we begin to go down this red line, it'll take more and more ID manual to make the motor spin. Okay, I'm hoping this is going to make sense here. Until eventually we get down here to the bottom of the trough, which will be a short range of values, typically less than 100 points, in which no matter how much manual ID that we put in there, uh, the motor does not spin. And that is the correct value. That value there is the one that we want to have in our sink offset. Okay, so this is the procedure this is a kind of a graph of it and i will go through this on our gen tree um and we'll see how as we begin to get nearer and creep nearer here it takes more and more manual id now it's a fairly coarse curve this is you know although it's just a sketch and a representation it's probably not that far off as in it does go over pretty quickly and then come back up pretty quickly and this is where, again, um, people get very confused because they think that this is where we actually want to be. You know, oh, the motor spins. Yay, I've got it. But in fact, it's not. Where you want to be is down here, where the motor does not spin with just a manual ID current. Okay, folks, so now is the time that we have, as we saw previously, we've done things like gotten our resolver working. We've done things like getting our pole pairs and our resol resolver pole pairs working. We got all the bugs out of that. And the time comes now to tune our value of sync offset. Now I'm filming this with the phone instead of doing a screen capture because I'm going to move you to the motor uh, very soon because I mean seeing me typing things in here 20 times is not going to be educational but I will show you me doing it once and then I will show you the motor and speak the values that I'm going to put in here. As you can see now we have a value of 10,200 in there. And that's a value that is very much in the bottom of that little trough uh, we showed you on the graph. And it is pretty much perfect, at least as far as I can tell, running it here on the bench with about 150 volts. Now, what I'm going to do now is we're going to remove that value here just put it back to the normal zero value that we start off with now i did see a guy on the forum had done something like had gone through all possible 65,535 values and still not got the thing to work now unfortunately the reason for that uh, most probably was either not having the right settings for pole pairs or resolver pole pairs or not having the resolver set up uh, correctly as we saw previously it is very important that we choose the right um, combination of the four possibilities of resolver connection so we now have a value of zero in here which we know to be incorrect but when we approach this for the first time of course we do not know that so what we do is we go to our commands we say start inverter in manual mode like so so we then go to our parameters and just confirm that our sync offset is indeed at zero now go to spot values that's how i generally get down here quickly and just up here then we'll see our manual IQ and our manual ID. What I'm going to do, I'm going to just pop into manual ID. I'm going to put 3 amps. I'm going to press enter. 
I hope you can hear that, but our motor is indeed spinning. I'm going to go back to zero here. And okay, so that means that we are in that large section of our graph where a small value of manual ID is sufficient to cause the motor to spin. So I'm going to bring you over here now and let you see the uh, half shaft cups on our transaxle. I'll just go back here and type 3 amps and press enter. And back to zero. So, first thing that that tells us, okay, is that our resolver is working properly. Because if it were not, we would not get that to happen. Now, so what we now have to do is, now the challenge is, okay, how do we, you know, we go back to our sink offset. So let me bring you back here. Here we go. So we go back to our sink offset and we say, okay, zero. What should we put in here? Okay, now keeping in mind, we know ahead of time that 10,200 is the value that we want to get to, but how, what kind of a jump would I make? Do I make 10? Do I make 1,000? Do I make 50,000? What do I do? Well, my rule of thumb is to go in 5,000 uh, jumps at this time. So I would go five, one, two, three, and enter. Back to just jump down here and back here into manual ID of three amps and press enter. Now, the motor did spin up, okay? But I want you to observe something. The very same three amps, the only thing that we've changed has been the value of sync offset. So let's go to three amps one more time. And zero. Now, you might have now noticed that it did not spin up as quickly or accelerate to as high of a speed. That means that we're beginning to approach the curve. We're not really, we're barely there on that graph. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go back to spot value, or sorry, back to parameters. I'm going to leave you guys on the on the um, mower here. I'm going to change my sink offset to 7,500. Because what I do is, when I see something like that happen, I have my jump. So I've now halved my 5,000 jump. I'm going to go back. Do the very same three amps here now. Enter. Oh, look at that, folks. It's not moving. Let's increase to six amps. Aha! I'm back to zero. Now, that's a vital clue. Three amps made it move very quickly when we were at zero. Three amps made it move reasonably quickly when we were at 5,000. But three amps could not make it turn at 7,500. So what I'm going to do now again, is I'm going to have my jump one more time. I'm going to go back to parameters. And I'm going to go, so I'm going to go to maybe 8,700. Um, 8, zero, zero, I'm going to press enter on that back to my spot values, back to my manual ID, I'm going to hit three amps. Oh, the little rock, but nothing happened. Back to six amps. Ooh, 12 amps. Aha! Now it took 12 amps. So what am I going to do now? I'm going to have my jump again because I know I'm homing in on it. And I'm also watching the direction now. Recall that our half shaft cups 
have been turning towards you, so in the reverse direction. What I'm going to do next is I'm going to show you what happens. Well, okay, I won't. <laughs> I'm jumping ahead of myself. Okay. So I'm going to have my jump again. I'm going to go back to parameters. So uh, I'm going to jump, let's say, maybe 500 points. So I was at 8,700. So let's increase to 9,200. Press enter. Back to my spot values and back to my manual ID. Back to my three amps. Nothing. Six amps. And I start to turn. But note that I'm turning slower and in the same direction as before. This is where this can be a little bit tricky. So, what we would have expected was that as I was going down that hill, that it would have needed more and more current. So that's a little thing that we need to watch out for. But again, I'm not going to get fooled. I'm going to come back here and I'm going to say, right, let's add another 500 points to that and go to 9,700, press enter, back to my manual ID, three amps, nothing, six amps, nothing, 12 amps, okay, definitely slower, back to my parameters, and I'm going to start going up in maybe 200. So I'm going to go to 9,900. And 3 amps. 6 amps. 12 amps. <gasps> Nothing at 12 amps. 25 amps. 50 amps. Okay, very good. 70 amps. 100 amps. Okay, do you see that and hear that? We're vibrating here, okay? And back to zero. That is another clear sign that we're homing in. Because what's happening there is that as we're ramming the current into the stator, the magnets in our stator and the magnets in our rotor are very nearly perfectly aligned. This is what we're trying to do. We're trying to line these magnets up. That's what sync offset is. So right now they're very close and the rotor is just doing a little shimmy. It can't flick to turn, but it's just shimmying around that fixed magnet. So. Now we want to do, this is the point where we actually want to do the small moves. So we're at 9,900, so let's go to 10,000. So I'm still moving, you know, I'm still moving in jumps of 100. So I'm not quite down to individual values yet. Uh, so back to spot values again, back to our manual ID. And again, we start with our three amps because we don't know what could happen here. 3 amps, nothing, 6 amps, nothing, 12, very interesting, and we begin to turn, but note something, it's in the same direction, now, what had happened, okay, if we went to our parameters and we said, oh well, you know, I'm still not near there, um, you know, what if I decided that, you know, I wanted a sink offset of 20,000. Let's say we had done an original jump to 20,000. So back here, I'm going to go for our old favorite, the three amps again. Oh my God. Now we're spinning really easily, but we're spinning backwards. Okay. When we overshoot our sink offset position, we will flip the direction of rotation. So, observe this. We got our three amps at 20,000. Turns the, our shafts in the drive position, so towards the wall from your perspective here. And if we were to go back to our original value here in our sink offset of 
zero. And back to our manual ID. What's gonna happen here is our motor is gonna turn in the other direction. So what we know is now that our value that we're looking for is somewhere between zero and 20,000. And what is the half of those values? It's 10,000. So 10,000 is pretty much almost exactly where we want to be, folks. Now, sometimes it worked like, like that. I've tuned about five motors with this theory, I guess you could call it so far. And it seems to work well. So let's go back to our 10,000 we found that we could actually spin the motor again with less current. So what we want to do here is to see, have I actually screwed up? Because I am not perfect. 10,100 this time. And I might well have that 10,200 value incorrect. So three amps, six amps. Small bit of rotation, but very, very slow. So 10,100. So let's go back to, let's change this now a very small amount. Let's go to 10,120. We're just bringing our, our changes uh, down 3 amps, 6 amps, 12 amps. Uh, 25 amps, 50 amps, 100 amps. Now, listen to that sound. We got no shimmy there at all with 100 amps of manual ID current. So now I'm going to bring you back to the computer and I'm going to show you the next step. So to test and see if this value is indeed right. The next thing that we want to do is in our manual ID box type 0 0.1, press enter. In our manual IQ box now, press 3, and our motor starts to spin. I'll just zero that again. I'll bring you over. So now we have manual ID set to 0.1 amps. And I'm going to give manual IQ 3 amps and press enter. So our motor now spins in the forward direction. If we want to check reverse in this situation, what do we do? We just minus three amps and press enter. So at this point, we are very, very near the bottom of our little graph. And the last thing that we want to do now is to go to our commands, stop the inverter and save the parameters to flash. And the final test then is to put our inverter into normal run mode just by pressing the start button or as I do, put it on the 12 volt battery terminal, make our throttle pedal. And as we can see, Pretty much got her dialed in. So folks, I do hope uh, this has helped you. I hope it will alleviate some of the tuning problems uh, that people have encountered. And I would like to think that it can act as a kind of a guide also that helps people to slow down a little bit and 
take the steps through the uh, procedure. And just to very quickly recap, first thing we do is use the sign firmware to check that our inverter and our motor work. So we can use like the inverter doesn't have a problem. The uh, motor can spin freely. It doesn't have a burnt out phase or something silly. The next thing then is we put our FOC firmware in there. We need to calibrate our current sensors if they are not properly calibrated. We need to set up our resolver so that we get the correct graph and uh, signals back into our STM32. Only at that point then should we attempt to run our motor with manual ID. We leave our sync offset at zero. If our manual ID injection causes the motor to rotate, that's good. It means our resolver is resolving. It's very important also that we pay attention to any resolver errors that might be reported on the inverter interface. If we have, for example, what's the usual one is low res amplitude, well, that's just not going to work for us. So we have to stop, we have to backtrack, we have to find out why our resolver signal is not being received correctly. There's simply no point proceeding if we do not have current sensors and resolver functioning in our inverter. At that point then, we can start tuning our sync, our sync offset uh, value based upon the procedure that we've just outlined for you. So, that's about it folks. Uh, this is going to be a long one. I'm going to leave this as a big one part video. Um, I'm hoping somebody will basically, I guess, put some time codes into this for you so that you don't need to watch the whole thing in order to get a specific, specific uh, part. Um, parameter files that I have made, like for even the Gen 2 and the Gen 3 transaxles here, will be on the Open Inverter forum. And additionally to that, uh, I would ask that when you get your project running, your motor spinning and so forth, that you share your files um, on here so that we can build up a database of these para parameters for various motors and various inverters so that hopefully before too long, it'll be a simple matter of loading the correct parameter file calibrating your throttle pedal and you're done. <laughs> so hopefully that day comes ahead and this video can be consigned to history. So I'll leave it there. Uh, this video will be on my channel and on Johannes's channel also, just to try to get it as out there as we possibly can, despite PooTube's best efforts. Um, I will ask in this case that you like, share and subscribe um, so that we can get this information out there to people. And do check the links in the descri description for things like the forum and um, anything else I can think to put in there that will be beneficial. Uh, so, that's it. And until next time, happy sync offset tuning. <laughs>